Welcome to the Truth Podcast. I'm your host, Hani Rambod. I'm here with my co-host, Austin, and we have a very special guest, a good friend, someone that uh, I used to work with for a very long time, about, what, 10 years ago, Fuad? Like 15 now. Is it really? Yeah, I'm old. What? <laughs> <laughs> We're all old. old. No, I'm just joking. We're I'm all joking. old. Well, I'm, 40, I'm 44. Yeah, man, I'm 44. I think we started working together when I was 30 or 29. Jeez. Yeah, that was, that was a long time ago. Ah, like 14 years ago, man. Wow. Wow. Time flies, brother. And yeah. um, it was great seeing you at the Arnold. You guys had a great amount of success. Congratulations to you, your team, Sam, uh, Samson. Yeah. Um, uh, I think we had a great time busting each other's balls. And then yeah. you have Paul, who's always great to to see. Yeah. And, you know, even though he does, it was a lot, you guys, it was are, a lot of fun. Brothers. You guys are hilarious. Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot of fun. We got to sit together. Me and you haven't had a chance to like sit down and really talk for a long time. So it was nice catching up at the hotel. Like everybody went to bed. I mean, you were just sitting there talking for, I don't know, three, four hours. And so it yep. was nice. It was nice catching up for sure. It was really good because you were in a good spot. You had, you know, you, your guy was, we, we were kind of going back and forth and believe it or not, what was funny was that <laughs> I, I was believed in Don't your say guy it. Don't say more it. than you did. <laughs> no. Okay. Can I add, can I address Whoa. this? So I, I have to address this. Yeah. And you probably know this from when I was competing. Yep. I, I'm a little messed up in that when I see something uh, I want or that is going to go right for me. Yeah. I think the worst first. That way I'm never disappointed. Does that make sense? I know. So I like, deal with you. You were, I had to literally <laughs> try to reprogram that out of you. No, but I'm like, I'm like, okay. I'm like, uh, Nick's probably going to win, but that way I'm not disappointed. And it's a great surprise when Samson wins. Bro, you had Sean Clarita beating him. I mean, you no, had, I did not. You had, <laughs> you're lying. Now you're being an asshole. <laughs> tell, tell me more about what happened at the hotel bar, apparently. So what happened at the hotel bar, yeah. I, this is what's, what's crazy is that I, I'm not used to Fuad and I going into that deep, dark hole of like, hey, let's talk about the assessments and breaking it up because we haven't done that in a long time. We used to actually do it after the shows. He would call yeah. me up. And before this podcast was a twinkle in his eye, we would have our own little, you know, uh, you know, Behro chat. It wasn't bro because it was like it was like the Middle Eastern version, Behro, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. it was Behro chat. And he'd be like, hey, man, what do you think of so-and-so? So-and-so just won. What do you think about him? How do you, you know, you think I would beat him? And I'd be like, yeah, man, I think you'd actually beat him. No, man, I don't think so. My legs aren't good enough yet. You know, it's funny, though. Can I ask you, when I talk to guys on the podcast now, I bring on various guests. Uh -huh. And I ask them and they all inevitably say the same thing. Oh, I don't look at anybody else. I call bullshit. I think that's fucking bullshit. I don't think athletes are not looking at other guys, but I don't think they ever want to say it. Absolutely. I think most of them do. I, but, why, why wouldn't, why, but why wouldn't they just answer that way then when I ask them like, hey, is there somebody you want to beat or somebody you're looking at? Because it sounds why like you're you... scared yes. that you're paying nah, attention to competitors. Not really. You're so, these are your, this is your, like, if you're, if you're the New England Patriots and you're going to play the Tampa Bay Bucks, you're going to watch the, the pregame and you're going to see what they did, why they're good, why they're winning and how you can beat them. It's no different. But here would be my argument with that is if you're doing that, it's a it's going to be a fight the day of where you can assess somebody else's skills and counteract them based on your performance that day. When you're a bodybuilder, when you're a bodybuilder, all you can legitimately do is bring your best for that day and the best package that you believe that you can attain because there's not something you can necessarily do on that day. Maybe pose slightly differently against somebody, no, no. but that'd be my argument. I agree with that. But if I look at a lineup of 10 guys and I'm like, all right, I have these qualities. Who else is competing? What qualities do they have? Mm -hmm. Where does that, where does that put me? That's not a fear thing. That's just a, I want to know what my goal is or what my expectation is where I, th who I think I can compete with and who I really want to beat to uh, increase my stock moving forward. So for me, I'll give you an example. So for me, for example, when I was competing, like if I was doing the Arnold or something, I was like, I want to beat Juan Morel. Mm -hmm. Not because I didn't like Juan Morel or whatever. It was just because I knew he was like that tier just above me. So I was like, if I can beat Juan Morel, that puts me in another category. Sure. So that's what I mean when I ask people, like, who are you looking at? Is there somebody that you want to beat that will increase your standing in bodybuilding or satisfy you that you did your job? Because we all know not everybody that goes into the show, even though they like to say it, think they're going to win. Especially when it's a show like a big show, like the Arnold or something. So if you don't think you're going to win, then what is your, what is a win for you? 
Like, where's like, where would you want to place to for it to be a victory? So I just think it's disingenuous when I say to somebody, Hey, you got a show coming up. Have you looked at the list? Do you know who's competing? You know where you're going to, you know, where do you want to be? And they're like, no, no, I don't pay attention to that. And I'm like, I don't think that's true. I, I don't, I don't. I don't think people like to admit it because they don't want people to feel like they're living rent free in someone's head. And I think that that's something where it's almost a, a sense of weakness with some athletes because they're like, Oh, I don't think of anybody else or I don't do this or I don't do that. And again, why do they do that? I think it's really more ego. I think most people that don't want to admit to it, it has to do with ego. I mean, honey, you have a mind for this and you've coached many, many Olympians. Mm -hmm. Is it, would you see it as being a weakness for an athlete to go, this is the lineup. Where do I fit? No, I don't think it's a weakness at all. But I have seen both sides. I feel like the guys that are top five, top six material at the Olympia, they're all looking to win. So they're just trying to come in. Most of them are going to come in with the best version of themselves. Mm. They're not going to worry so much about the other people. Now, But but sorry, let me ask one question just on that topic. So if I I was saying that, I would be like, okay, because I was never one of those top five guys. So I'm like, I'm not. I want you were to top five, but not not at the Olympia. But you were top five when we were doing when we did Flex Pro. We were, no, no, I mean, I mean, like overall in bodybuilding. Oh, like okay. I was not. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, even amongst those top five, like let's take uh, Brandon Curry for example. Mm-hmm. If he's walking into last year's Olympia, isn't he going? Okay, I want to win for sure. That's my goal. But Nick has this. Derek has this. Rami has this. Can I win? Like, how am I going to win? Like, is he still not doing that? Or is, is, are they still not looking at second, third, fourth? No, I don't think so. I think that yeah. guys like Brandon Curry, and I have a little bit of sense into kind of how his thought process is, is that he's probably focusing on the best version of himself. Mm-hmm. And he's not really looking at what these other guys are going to bring in because sure. he is at that level of being in the top five where he's not going to mess with big Rammy or this guy or, you know, hottie or any of Mm. the other people in the top five. What he's doing is he's going off of the mirror and what his coach is telling him. And I feel that what he's focusing on is that now, if you're looking at breaking into the top five, or if you're going in for your second or third pro show, or you're looking at what are those lower level wins to get to those milestones, I feel that those are things where you can be like, okay, let's create what's successful. What's success? Let's measure yeah. success. And yeah, I think yeah. you and I used to do that, right? Yeah. You would yeah. say, hey, look, I would really like to be able to get in the top three because this guy, this guy, and this guy is doing the show. And if I can go against Dexter Jackson, and if I'm going up against, uh, God, who who did you go up against? Dennis, Dennis Wolf. Dennis Wolf. You know, yeah. I mean, those guys were, yeah. <laughs> you have ex Mr. Yeah. Olympia, and then yeah. you also have somebody that was out there in the top five several times. Uh, yeah. with Dennis Wolf. So, and I think he placed third at that show, right? I was third. Yeah. yeah. Behind, uh, Evan and Dexter. Right. That's who it was. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. uh, who, who was fourth? Dennis. And then fifth was Ben Pakulski. Right. So you beat yeah. Ben and you beat Dennis Wolf and yeah. Yeah. you arguably could have been even a little bit higher too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it was what, you know, there was a couple years there where Dexter was off just a little bit. Yeah. And like, he kind of found his groove again after that. Mm-hmm. I think that was like 2011, 2012, or maybe those one or two years where Dexter kind of was for the first time ever in his career was kind of missing being perfect. Right. But even though Dexter wasn't perfect, he still was Dexter. Yeah. He's so, so phenomenal. So, yeah. Still phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. 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 But I think so, that those are the things that we measure depending on how you measure success. So my question for yeah. you right now is that when you're doing that, do you feel like it's a strength or weakness for someone not to do that because you were a person that did it, right? You created that. Do you feel like it's a weakness that when somebody doesn't? I think if, uh, no, if you don't do it and you just focus on yourself, that's great. That, that doesn't, that eliminates a lot of variables and eliminates a lot of fear. It elim- eliminates a lot of like, Oh, this guy's going to beat me. And then it can become crippling. Um, but I don't think it's wrong to do it as long as it doesn't cripple you. Like if you're looking at a lineup and you see a couple guys that are better than you and it's, it's wreaking mental havoc on you daily while you're trying to prep for a show, then yeah, I definitely think that's wrong. In that case, I would say, look, you stay off social media, 
avoid these guys' pages and just focus on yourself. Don't. But I think if you're the kind of guy that's pretty logical, like I might have been a little bit hard on myself and and you know anxious, but I was always a realist in like where I thought I could place. Mm -hmm. I think if you are just objective and you can look at a lineup objectively and say, this is a victory for me. I think it's okay. I think, like I said, though, if it starts to affect you mentally and it affects your performance and it's like making you, you know, your cortisol levels rise and you're, I think then it's probably too much. And I, for me, it was somewhere in, in between. Cause I don't, I don't, I, I'm, I'm just going to throw it out there. I don't think a lot of the guys from what I've seen are that very stark, strict, logical type. Cause there are people where like, if something is said about them, it's like a, it's a whole thing or, you know, well, and I'm not, I'm not saying that too much about everybody. I'm saying like, it is hard to be fully objective when it comes to your physique and how people are talking about it and just comparative to other people. So I feel like that's why people stay away from that. I have known you, I've, I've always, from hearing you and stuff, you are just like super logic yeah, I'm, fact based, you know? And so. I, I mean, I, uh, let's take Ian, for example, right? Ian is very real about who he is. So like when he, when we would talk about last year's Olympia and we're talking about 35 guys, mm -hmm. Ian is focused on himself and he knows what he has to do, but he also knows who's in the lineup. And he's like, I would like to be better than seventh because I was seventh the last two years. But he's also not saying I'm going to win. Like he's also another person that I think is very objective and, and, can look at a lineup and really believe what he says when he says, you know, some guys look at a lineup and they're like, yeah, I'm going to win. And you, and you're thinking to yourself, there's no way you're going to win. So I feel like that's disingenuous also. Like it's great to be confident, but like, are you real with yourself? Right. right. You know? So, well, you know, a I, lot of, you have a, you have a really good sense from working with people, whether it's within your brand or whether it's a podcast or just being in the industry, right. For a while now, do you feel like there's other people that are kind of, a little far the other way. Like, I mean, and that are in the top five or six, like you have a relationship with Nick Walker. I mean, do yeah. you, how do you feel about like how, what's, what's his personality? Do you feel compared to like an Ian? Well, this is the thing. The first ever podcast I did with Nick was before I really knew him. Uh -huh. And we did a one-on-one -on -one and he was like, I'm going to win the Mr. Olympia in two years. And in, in my head, I was like, this kid's fucking crazy. <laughs> right. But, but, but it was almost like drew me to him. I'm like, it didn't seem, it didn't seem arrogant. It just said, it seemed like this guy's got a lot of fucking confidence. I don't know if he's insane, but I like it. That's kind of how I saw it. Because right? you're not that person. You're very opposite. No, no, I'm the, I'm the fucking exact opposite. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to do my best and see. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so, so like, it, it was crazy for me to hear it. Right. But then when he started competing, you know, he won New York. Yeah. And then he fucking won the Arnold. Yeah. I'm like this kid could be fucking right. Like, you know, he's, and that's why I never took it as arrogance. I took it as like a really firm belief in his own abilities. Okay. So I think there's a difference when someone says I'm going to win and you know, they're full of shit. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to win. And you kind of know that that guy knows something about himself. So, well, can I, can I, can I challenge you at that though? Sure. I think that the bottom line is he's backed it up. Well, yeah, but I mean, I'm because talking it, about, bef but I'm talking about before he backed it up. Okay. So the first, so the first interview we did, I don't know if it was before his first pro show right, or at, or after, because I think his first pro show, he was fourth, I think. Um, and I don't remember which, if it was before or after, but he had never proved anything yet of the standard that he was talking about. So I was like, this kid's fucking crazy, but in a good way. Okay. Right. I'm like, I'm like, this is, so you, you don't know, but then right. other people, other people say it. And you know, it's like a facade. Yeah. Like, I don't know if they just think it's something they have to say, or they're trying to talk themselves into it. You right. can just, you can, you can tell the difference. And with Nick, he ended up backing it up, but I think it's because he's got that like really firm belief. It's not a facade. He's not just talking about it. He's not just, you know, creating an image. I think he really has that belief in himself. So if he, on the flip side of that, do you feel that blessing does the same thing though? How, how's he different? Mm -hmm. Besides obviously his placing isn't, isn't there, but because they've gone back and forth, he sounds very similar to that, but do you feel like it's different because, and, different. And, and take, and take apart a, aside the fact that he hasn't been able to live up to that, to that standard that he's kind of set, but just in general, do you feel like it was the same or do you feel like that was different? I think it's different. I think Nick is, 
and I hope Blessing doesn't take any offense to this because I think Blessing is a, is a very good bodybuilder. But I think Nick lives bodybuilding 24-7 and nothing can interrupt that. Mm-hmm. Not not money, not girls, not work, nothing. It's like, this is all I am here on earth to do. That's Nick, right? Blessing is like, I'm a really good bodybuilder and I think I can be great, but I also like to be an entertainer. Okay. Right. So I think he's playing a part okay. mm-hmm. to a certain degree, but also has a belief in himself, but it's not the same as Nick. He's not, at least from what he portrays, he's not living the same way Nick is. Mm-hmm. Maybe this year, like this last off season, he looks like he's made like incredible progress. I don't know, but I think more ble- what Blessing's doing when he talks about winning the Olympia or, you know, being in the first call out, I think he's, kind of playing a wwe character to a certain degree that's i feel like to me there's three types of people blessing is one nick is one and then there's one in the middle so we have that's blessing right. yeah. we have blessing yeah. who i do think that deep down there's some self-awareness there where he knows like okay i'm not in that top that's, however that's many right. but i'm gonna yeah. make my brand off of being loud and big and like you said the wwe style then to me there's yeah. the people in between who are who have that outrageous confidence in themselves, but don't have anything to back it up. But they mm-hmm. genuinely believe in themselves. So when they talk about it, it's like, wow, okay. It's like the people who go on American Idol, where like my mom says I'm the best singer in the entire world. I'm so good. You can tell in their eyes they believe it, and then they start singing yeah. completely tone deaf. So it's like yeah. they have that belief in themselves, but no self awareness that they're actually objectively yeah. good or bad. But then yes. you have like the Knicks who are like they are have that outrageous confidence in themselves. But they yeah. also know they can back it up. And that's like a dangerous, quiet confidence when somebody has that. Well, it's like, you know, one of the things they used to talk about with Conor McGregor was, you know, Dana White used to always say, yes, he's loud and he's brash mm. and he makes predictions. But this kid has all the confidence in the world in himself. So it's it, I feel like Nick is that way. Not that he talks like that, but he actually believes what he says it's not just an act but there's a fourth person you forgot to mention and Mm -hmm. that's the person that's the person that there's like four and five there's like the objective person that knows where they're going to place and then there's the guy that's really good that thinks he's shit yeah like if if you talk about like frank mcgrath that's a guy that was harder on himself than anybody i know in bodybuilding Mm -hmm. but arguably could have been a top 10 olympian like before his car accident and all that so this is a guy that like does not see what everybody else sees in his physique. So then you have those guys as well. I know I, I used to have friends back in the day that looked like I always talk about my one friend, uh, Lou Joseph, the guy looked like Sean Ray at 19 years old, but he never had a website, never came out with any shirts, just didn't really have the same belief in himself or see the goods that he had. So then you have those guys too, that have the capability, but don't have the belief. Yeah, I think that on that side, who do you think in the top 10 is kind of don't don't believe in themselves as much as they should? Because now that we're kind of going through all of these different athletes and their personas and how they kind of either exemplify excellence and trying to push for that or somebody who's kind of more toned down versus what they are actually capable of. Where do you see that on that spectrum? Ani, I couldn't tell you, to be honest with you, man, because, you know, me and Paul were talking about this the other day. It's a generational thing. Things have changed so much. If you think back just 10 or 20 years, it was very rare that you got a guy saying, I'm going to win a show. I'm going to mm-hmm. destroy everybody. I mean, you had some here and there, but it was not everybody. It was like a few would say that. Very few. Now I feel like it's, you have to talk like that. Mm-hmm. I, I very rarely hear people. And I just think, I think um, Stu Sutherland was just on my podcast. It was mm-hmm. actually really re- it was really refreshing for me to hear him say, I'm going to do New York and I'm going to just do the best I can and and see where I see where I place. He's not one of these guys who's like, yeah, I'm going to go in. I'm going to destroy everybody. And like, I, I think I can be in the top 10 at the Olympia. Like uh, that doesn't happen anymore. Like that, that humble, like humility, mm-hmm. I feel like is rare nowadays. So if you tell me like who in the top 10 believes that, I don't know who to pick out. Because if you look at the top five, none of them, then where do you go from there? You go Hunter. No, he believes he can be great, which he can. He's proved he can be in the. Yeah, but like, he's not super loud. He's not. No, no, no. That's, what, that's what I'm saying. That's right. what I'm saying. Like he, he's not, but he doesn't disbelieve in himself is what I'm saying. Like he's okay. not uh, Andrew. Same thing. He thinks he can be great. 
you know, William Bonac is obviously a veteran. He doesn't say good or bad. And then you have Raphael. He also thinks he can be great. There's not really anybody in the top 10 that's like, yeah, I'm okay. But then they're exceeding their, what they think of themselves. Sure. You know yeah. what I mean? So yeah. all, all of, all of them have that belief. And it, we've also talked about this on my podcast, which is, is that belief what carries you into the top 10? I think it is. I think yeah, that the because, reason you get into the top 10 is because you have to have a certain level of belief. And yeah. I think a guy like William Bonac is a great example because I also think he's a realist. And I think yes. that, you know, he's a person who's been around for a while who can look at himself and say, yeah, I was off or I was on. And yeah. he's not a person that's going to sit there and, and blow smoke up his own ass and say, yeah, I should have been a lot higher. I don't understand why I wasn't. I got robbed. I got this. And I think that he realizes that he's just seeing things without the rose colored glasses where yeah. some of the people are like, man, I should have won or I been here and I got robbed because of A, B and C. And, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and I think that's what happens sometimes. But I, I, the other, per that, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. It's okay. No, I was going to say like, you know, the other person that comes to mind right now too, in the top 10 that you spoke about earlier, Ian, right? Ian yeah. is a person who I've seen uh, just looks absolutely amazing on, you know, in this prep and he was trying to like nail that prep last year. And, yep. and sometimes I feel like some of the guys, Ian might be one of them, a couple of others where you just can't play the emotions of social media and you have to turn that down. Some people yeah. use it to build up, but I think yeah. that some people just really have to like step away from it a little bit because, yeah. because you, it becomes emotionally charged. And I think that that situation might've happened with him at the Olympia last year because he was looking so good, like the week into it, going into it. And I feel like sometimes you kind of like play off of that, that energy. And yeah. it's yeah. one of those things where you have to just really maintain a certain level. And this is what I personally do, especially now you and I, not so much back when I was working with you because social media wasn't as big as it yeah. is now, yeah. where we have to manage that because you, if you start getting too distracted and you start looking at everybody's highlight reel, you mm -hmm. might start making mistakes. You do the cardio, yeah. you do too much cardio, or you do this. Yeah. I've had actually this conversation with um, Derek, Derek yeah. last year, where, you know, sometimes I would say, dude, you're on social a little too much because you're, yeah. you know, it, I don't want it to get into his head. And not that it got into his head, but just there's, there's a susceptibility that can occur yes. because you're waiting for your next meal. You're going on your phone. You're, you're trying to do your posts for your sponsor. You're trying to do this, but then you're starting to see all everybody else's highlight reel. And they're all taking these new photo, the photos, the newest updated photos on their magic light. We use that magic yeah. light, that natural yeah. light or that gym lighting. And mm -hmm. it's this great light. And you're like, wow, this guy's gigantic. He's ripped. He's this and that. And I go, stop worrying about that because it doesn't matter what you look like in the gym. It matters what you look yeah. like on stage. Also, you can turn up the clarity on a photo by like, Five percent doesn't change the photo at all. Doesn't make anything look different yeah. necessarily, but like it all it just cuts the you know makes things a little bit deeper, a little sharper, a little yeah. You can change like, sharp, yeah. You can do that. Filters. You know, one of the biggest things about that though also is you never have the right perception of yourself. Hmm. So you're not only looking at somebody's perfect photo, mm -hmm. but maybe if you've been shredded for three or four weeks now and you're waiting to get on stage, you guys know you've competed. The longer you're shredded, the less in shape you feel. Mm -hmm. So now you're looking at somebody's picture that they just posted three weeks out. It looks incredible. And you're like, am I that shredded? Do I look like that? <laughs> so that, so then that starts to play on your, and then, like you said, then you'll end up doing more cardio. Then you start burning away glycogen, burning away muscle. Who knows? Yeah, no, there's a hundred percent, uh, something that goes with that. But as far as Ian goes, I don't know if it was social media as much as it was a couple things. One, I think he had trouble peaking. They, they tried a couple different things that they okay. don't, don't normally do. Um, and I think too, I, I feel like Ian and myself are a little bit alike. I was probably worse than he is. Well, that's why actually I brought him up because yeah, I, yeah. I feel like some of the things that from yeah, what I've heard yeah. is similar to what you, I know from you working with you in the past. He, um, I feel like Ian is a little bit more robotic than I was. So I, I would say we both have an anxiousness about us, but I'm more emotional. Yes. So that's why he's had more success. And I think even though he's like that, the, 
the magnitude of that show, because if you think about Ian's situation, he was seventh two years in a row. Mm -hmm. And now he's like, okay, well, in, in Ian's mind, and he said this, to feel successful, I have to be sixth or better. But now he's in a lineup that's 20 guys deeper. Right. For sure. So it's like, so now, so now this pressure is mounting. It's like, you know, do I, am I going to place better? And if I don't place better, does that mean I lost? And so maybe that pressure is what took him off his game in combination with some of the peaking issues they had. I don't know. But he told me he felt uncomfortable on stage. Like he didn't feel like he was posing well. Mm -hmm. He didn't feel. So all that stuff plays a part. Like, but ultimately he said also to me that the placing didn't matter as much as the fact that he didn't feel like he was at his best. Got it. So then you have to ask yourself, was he not at his best because of the pressures or because of the peak? Right. Or we don't really know, you know, which one played more of a part. How much of that, again, trying to bring that parallel back to you, do mm -hmm. you feel if you were a little bit more, do you feel like if you had a little bit more of those emotions under control, do you think that you would have been better? Yes. A thousand percent. I've told people like ever, and it goes back to the conversation we're having about, um, having that confidence. We've had this conversation numerous times on my podcast and it's, we don't know, do you need that confidence first to be in the top 10 or is that confidence built through placing and then you get to the top 10? Like, is it the chicken or the egg, right? So my confidence came from doing well at shows, but you don't always get what you want and place where you want at a show. So if you do bad at a show, then your confidence goes like this. If you right. do well at a show, then your confidence goes like this. And it's like the ideal situation is that you have your confidence and it's stable and you can build on it. So for me, for sure, my emotions totally messed with me because if I didn't get the placing I wanted or I didn't show up at my best, my confidence went from here to here and then I had to work to build it back up. Right. So I was always playing this roller coaster game with myself where I wasn't as confident as I, confident as I should have been. And now that I'm retired and I look back at you know, pictures, I'm like, some of my best looks would have been really good had I stayed consistent. I probably would have broken into that top 10 at the Olympia potentially one day. Yeah. So, I mean, you look, you live and learn and you, mm -hmm. and you make mistakes and the mental game and bodybuilding is, is huge. It's, I would say it's, I don't know. I don't know what the percentage to put on it, but it's, it's just as important as your physique. If you don't have the mental strength like when you when you listen to phil talk yep he seems very focused like his mental state is very like one track yes i'm gonna kill everyone mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like you know what i mean it's very yes and i think that's what it takes I, I don't think phil would be phil without that mindset even though he's got even though he has the genetics yeah i agree i mean working with him for a long time he does have that stableness to him where he can be able to yeah. overcome a lot of different adversity because, yeah. you know, with his dad passing away one year and then going through divorce and just business situations that happened. I mean, he would just hunker through it. He mm -hmm. really would. He would, he would definitely yeah. cut out the the highs and the lows and just in the meat and potatoes were always, you know, he would take yeah. it out in the gym. He really was, he knew when to turn it on and he knew when to turn it off and when to back it off in regards to not yeah. trying to get too caught up in in bs that was going on and yeah. i think that was able to, to really help him create that consistency that you were talking about yeah you see the the tough part is trying to teach like a new person coming up because you're like you want to say to them hey you should be confident but then you don't want to run into an issue like austin was saying where you've given a guy so much you built up his confidence so much that he's way more confident than his capabilities. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's tough because you want, you want to tell people, look, you have to be confident to be the best, but then you also want to tell them you have to ha have a real, don't be full of yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's, <laughs> it's such a tough line to walk. It, it is it's like, it so is. I don't know, but yeah, it has a lot to do with it. And it's also the coachability aspect of it, because mm -hmm. if someone's going to be listening to multiple people and they're not yeah. going to sit there and be that coachable, that becomes yeah. very problematic. They, you know, they want to listen to everybody around them in the gym and they want to go to the lowest common denominator it happens a lot when you're a coach and somebody in the gym's telling somebody to do 45 minutes of cardio, but your coach is telling you to do an hour or doing 30 minutes. And then they want to go back and just try to just justify whatever it is. 
that mm-hmm. made sense to them. Oh, I, I look like shit. I'm going to do more. And then the coach is saying, no, you need to do less because I don't want you to run, you know, do yeah. so much that you're going to lose your legs or, yeah. or the opposite. No, you're out of shape. You need to do a little more cardio. And then somebody in yeah. the gym, your workout, the workout partner wants to feel like that they're involved with it. And yep. they want to say, I, I'm, I'm prepping them behind the scenes. I mean, I deal with this shit all the time, right? It's but I was going to say, you can't, you can't still deal with that. Like, I do. I'm, I do. I still do. I do. Okay. I mean, look, it doesn't happen nearly as much because I don't work with as many people. And I never worked with more than 15, 20 people at a given time. It's just, yeah. just my system's not. I mean, that's including some off, you know, half the people in the off season. And then maybe a handful of people that are actually doing prep. And then a, a handful of people doing, uh, let's say, some kind of lifestyle a yeah. pro- program with me, you know, an executive yeah. at companies or uh, any of that, something of that nature. What happened in the past was definitely much more susceptible because you're working with people, especially as you're coming up, right? Mm-hmm. As you're coming up, you're, well, the, you're yeah. dealing with that much more. That's kind of what I was getting at is at this point with, you know, 25 Olympias or 30 Olympias or <laughs> whatever you have on your record, a hundred Olympias. I don't know. <laughs> no. Uh, whatever. 22 bro 22 <laughs> whatever <laughs> amount of olympias that. you have now yeah. um you can't i can't possibly imagine somebody coming to you you giving them instructions and then being like ah i think my partner knows more like that can't happen to you anymore it i does. can see it maybe it does it, are you fucking serious yeah but you know how it works huh. it's the guy that i'm giving the free advice to in the gym that i see mm. and that's got decent potential and then you i'm can't. sitting there and then they're just like if you ever want somebody to doubt you, give them some information for free. My therapist, I had a, a life coach, a sports life coach, which didn't, I don't know, obviously he helped, but not as much as he, he <laughs> should have. <laughs> as, I was, after we finished talking about all of the mental <laughs> issues and emotional I was too issues. Far, and, I was too far gone. Was yeah, killing yeah. You. You're killing me, bro. <laughs> now the sports no, therapist no. was super <laughs> effective. <laughs> no, no, wait, time up. Listen, I have to tell you, he was actually very effective, but my... <laughs> he, he told me, he t- he for told everybody me but you no no he told me one time he's like your fucking brain works in a way where once you believe something that is it nobody can change your mind nobody can fucking that's how i was before anyway i don't know if i'm still like that but so but that would throw it out though wouldn't it because you what well, i was gonna say because then that would mean you were changing over time no but what i'm saying is back in the day he would say mm, like back in the day. if so like when I was working with Hani, for example, he would say like, look, when, when you think something, you have a very hard time changing it. So for example, when the Arnolds would come around and I'm like, man, I'm going to get killed. There's all these good guys. And I would be panicked. Once that thought is in your head, in my head anyway, it's hard to go against it. Yeah. So I would just, I would just get more and more anxious as I got to this massive show. And I was never, I was never able to perform at the big shows the way I was maybe at the smaller shows, you know? So yeah, anyway, you, you, you were a person that one, you wanted people to prove you wrong. Cause you wanted, even if you, it was against you, against yourself, yeah. you're like, no, I'm shit. Prove me wrong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know why. Just, but that that was you. That I mean, yeah. that was something I had to constantly work on because yeah. we would sit down and, and talk about things for a couple of hours sometimes about why you should be doing gluten-free pasta and then you'd be like okay this is great we remember we talk about that and then you, you're like this is the most amazing thing ever and then um and then i would switch it because of whatever reason and then you turn around and be like no no we need to go back to that because that i told you that was the key bro. I'd, I'd fixate I'd you would fixate, fixate. Honestly, that's the good yeah. word fixate you um, get fixated no but going back to what you said about free yeah my my therapist at the time because i was broke i said to him hey man you know, we're kind of friends now. Like maybe I can, maybe you can give me a sponsorship and like, I can come see you. And he would be like, no, I can't. And I'm like, why? He's like, because if you give somebody something for free, Mm -hmm. they were, they will devalue it. And even then I understood that. I'm like, you know what? He's right. Cause I used to drive four hours to go see him every week. Oh, I remember. I remember he was in Canada, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's in Canada. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I used to drive four hours to go see him. And I'm like, maybe he's right. Maybe if it was free, I wouldn't make that drive. Maybe I wouldn't value it as much. And I think it's the same thing with coaching and giving people advice. If you just tell the guy in the gym randomly, he's probably like, ah, whatever. But if you charge somebody five grand or whatever it is, they're probably going to see more value in it. Yeah, because they're going to turn around. And when you get value, when you feel that sense of value, what's going to happen is they're going to be able to want to be able to like cross every T, dot every I. 
And that sense of urgency and the sense of detail goes way up. And yeah. when you no longer have that, what happens is then they start to incorporate their own information. And, yeah. and this is what happens with coaching, at least for me in the past, was that they would add their own because they've lowered the sense of value of the information yeah. that they've received. So mm -hmm. what happens is they have to add in their value so that they can say, I'm going to come up with this ultimate recipe because this recipe that I got online is really okay and yeah, it's yeah. good, but I yeah. can make it more excellent, like more mm -hmm. excellent, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, but if they went to a five-star chef, you know, a three Michelin star chef and the guy, and that chef for a thousand dollars said, I'm going to give you, the, I'm going to write you up this great recipe for this meal yeah and they went and paid for it and they sat down with them and they were taught how to do it that person's going to follow every single detail of how yeah. to measure from the flour to the sugar to the salt just impeccably because yeah. they were trained at that point versus it was suggested because oh, yeah, it wasn't paid for and i feel like that sense of value so if you're a coach out there really put value in the information and if you want people to listen to you Make sure you do that because a lot of people, when they find somebody with genetics, they're going, Hey, look, this guy's got good genetics. I'm going to do something for free or I'm going to do this. And they don't yeah. understand. It doesn't matter at whatever level they're at. There needs to be some sense of value that is high enough for people to want to listen to it. Do you think, and this just crept into my mind, do you think it creates a sense of hierarchy as well? Yes. Because if you, because if you charge somebody, like if I'm an athlete and I get, and I have to pay a coach. Yes. I see them as above me, if that makes sense. Right. So I'm like this, I'm paying for this service. This person knows more than I know. I'm going to listen to them. Where is if you come to me and say, Hey, I got some advice for you. Then I see us as equals maybe. Cause I'm like, Oh, he's just, you know, rattling off some information. I or got it. Whatever. Because they're just giving yeah. you things. That's right. That's right. So maybe the, maybe the financial aspect also creates the hierarchy you need to be able to instruct and not just suggest. It absolutely does. I think that yeah. when you look at it as that that person is hire, hire a bull and you're hiring them and you're yep. focusing on that, now you've created a bond and almost a contract, whether it's written or not, saying right. that you're going to give me a sense of information. And I think that the other thing on the flip side of that, it makes there, there has to be accountability on mm -hmm. both sides. So then the coach also says, look, I'm going to give you my best because this person paid for it. So That's right. what also happens is that person, instead of saying, well, I, he didn't pay me for it. So I'm not going to return that text message right away. I'm going to go ahead and get back to him in three or four days. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So instead yeah. of, Hey, I'm going to get back to him in 24 hours or 12 hours or whatever the, your agreed upon yeah. uh, response time is going to be. Mm -hmm. So what happens is it works both ways because it gets devalued. So when you do a lot of trading and you do a lot of that, you end up losing that, that sense of, you know, hierarchy yeah. that you mentioned. Yeah. 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 So I just thought, I just thought of somebody that, uh, would be in the top 10 that didn't have the top 10 mindset, I guess you would call it. Mm -hmm. If you, I thought about Cedric, Cedric was that. a guy, Cedric was a guy who struggled a lot with the vision of himself yeah and his his humility was almost more than it needed to be and didn't see i think the perfection that was his was his physique yeah, yeah god rest so, his soul he, yeah so he, I, he really you, you're right um he was very hard on himself very hard on himself i, I didn't speak yeah. to him that often but the mm -hmm. people that i know that were close to him all told me that he really had just definitely confident he wasn't as confident as his abilities were and i think yeah you definitely he was a person that could use that boost of confidence to get him yeah. to that next level because yeah i didn't want to i didn't want to kind of interject in the middle of that conversation i just it just kind of clicked yeah no. of somebody that really fit that mold more so than than anybody like that mm -hmm. he had this is somebody potentially that had an olympia caliber physique like winning the olympia yes and I agree. I don't, I don't know if he saw that in himself. Yeah. That, so, that, that's, that would have been great to see if yeah. it was just, and if he had that, he probably would have been able to go a little further with that conditioning that he always needed to kind mm -hmm. of bring that in together because his frame was just like amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And going into that now, we're talking about your 
past with your com- competitions, is there somebody that you just absolutely wanted to always beat that you felt like you had that, <laughs> you know, you, we talked about this earlier, like, like, Hey man, let's talk about whatever it is. And that's one of those things. Cause you're so competitive. You're a very, very competitive individual in every aspect of your life. Yes. And I feel that, was there somebody that you just always were like, I got to beat this I, guy. I always wanted to be Ben, but I did. So I was happy. <laughs> <laughs> ben Pakalski. Yes. <laughs> Why is that? Um, is that just because you're both from Canada? Uh, there was always like this unspoken rivalry. So I was like, I'm going to beat Ben no matter what. It's tough. I know people from the U.S. don't understand it because most bodybuilders come from the U.S. Right. But when you're from another country and you're in bodybuilding, right. you're never seen as, you're always seen as being from that country. Like if you talk about Ian, you're like, that's the Canadian bodybuilder. If you talk about Samson, that's the U.K. bodybuilder. He's not just a bodybuilder. He's a UK bodybuilder. Right. So when you come from these other countries, you always want to be the best from that country. Your, yeah. Like, mm. you know, I want to be the best Canadian or, you know, Samson wants to be the best UK guy or whatever country you're from, or like he day wanted to be the best Japanese bodybuilder ever. So right. there was always this unspoken rivalry because me and Ben, like I turned pro, then he turned pro and we kind of were making some of the same moves with contracts and magazine sponsorships and doing well at shows and, so I think that was always uh, something in my head, and I remember he just he was a he was a fucking dick. He, <laughs> <laughs> not not in a, not in a bad way. I'm over I'm over it now. But, but at the time, I remember I remember he. This, so this is the kind of shit he would do, and I find it funny now because it's ten years later. I remember I think I think it was the uh, Arnold. He took second at one of the Arnolds, and uh, a Dexter won. And I remember that, or I think it was 2012, potentially. I don't I think it was 2012. So you know how they used to have the riser where you would step up and go yeah. and the call out would be on the riser and everybody else would be standing below. Yeah. So me and him are standing like off to the side. Uh-huh. He's standing right in front of the stairs. I'm standing like three or four guys over. So they call my name, I think for the second call out. I'm not sure if it was, yeah, I think it was second call out. So I'm walking by him to get to the stairs to walk up onto the riser. And as I'm walking by him, he goes, I think your tan is turning green. <laughs> I'm like, you motherfucker. He's saying that like, to you? Yes. Oh, just as I, mind just games. as I, yeah, just as I walk by him to go onto the riser. And I'm like, all I could think is what a fucking ass for him to say that to me right now. <laughs> Cause it wasn't like a helpful thing. It was yeah. like, ah, but was it turning green though? When you go back and look at it or no? No, no, oh. it totally wasn't. <laughs> So what I think when I think about it now, I actually think it's fucking hilarious. But at the time, I was like, "What a fucking dick!" Dude. So those were those but, Arnold Arnold Ferrigno mind games that he was playing. That's what I know, right? So, um, but no. Uh, as far as competitively, like to get ahead, um, you know, I always thought I was just outside that top six group, like at the Arnold's and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Or like just in, just in standing, I always thought it was, you know, a second tier guy that wanted to be in the first tier. And I always thought like Juan Morel was that barrier to entry. Okay. Cause Juan was always like usually a six guy, fifth guy somewhere in there. So I was like, I'd like to be able to beat Juan Morel. Maybe that will put me into the, into the group. Um, but I don't remember really specifically wanting to beat anyone. There wasn't anybody like I disliked. I just, I always wanted to beat somebody that was in that first tier to catapult myself into it. Um, but it just, I don't know. It wasn't meant to be, I guess. Do you think that your viewpoint of being more realistic, logical, where you fit in that kind of placing, do you think that that would have changed if you did beat some of those guys and launch into that group? Uh, potentially, but like I said, it's the chicken or the egg, right? So like, Mm -hmm. I think, I think I had the physique, but not the mental attitude to do that. And I think working with Hani helped me. So like in 2011, I did do potentially some of that, but then Hani was too busy to work with me after that. So I had to go find out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 It all, no, it you talked to yourself out, out of it. All, it oh it man, all, you, gonna, you want to go all, there? We can talk about all, that. We the truth podcast. The the truth really, like, we can talk about that. Here. That, was, that <laughs> was his sense of reality for him because he talked himself into that. It was because, all downhill after that until I met John. Then I was on my way back up, but it was too late at that time. <laughs> That's it. That's it. I mean, listen, I, I look, look, I'll be honest. It was probably a little bit my fault. Okay. Okay. A little <laughs> but, bit, a little bit more than a little bit, but it's okay. Maybe a little bit. 
a little bit. Yes. Uh, you talked yourself out of it. You're the type of guy at the time. And, and I know that you've changed since then because we've talked and, and you know, even though there's some little resonance of those things, yeah. but yeah. back then you could look, let's just say you did well, you did yeah. well, we, we did well, we looked really good. And then you'd be like, I robbed some people. <laughs> you know? hey, 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 did you did you go and uh, put a good word in for me somewhere? <laughs> you know, like, the and I'm like, today. it's literally that's the kind of shit he would come yeah, up with. It's I mean, true. it it's was true. like there was so much self doubt in the starting point yeah. that it was like, and it was not just in bodybuilding. We would talk, and it would be just across the board with sponsors, with this, with that. Like, it, it, there was obviously some stuff that resonated. You know, look. Can I, can I just, I'll, I'll encompass the whole thing. Okay. It's just imposter syndrome. Mm. Sometimes, sometimes you get ahead in life mm -hmm. and look, I, I still have remnants of it. Mm -hmm. I still do. Even like, I look at hostile and how well we're doing. I look at the podcast, how well it's doing. I'm like, mm -hmm. sometimes I can't figure it out. I'm like, I'm like, what is going on? Why is this doing so well? Right. Because it's imposter syndrome. You think to yourself, and this is a, still some of the shit I, and it, this was much more powerful back in the day. But you think to yourself, well, maybe I don't deserve this. Maybe I'm fooling them somehow into thinking I deserve to be here. Maybe I tricked somebody or you, you never, that's like the highest form of imposter syndrome is you're never able to just give yourself credit for what it is you achieved. Yeah. That's, that's, that's ultimate. That was ultimate. Yeah. That's kind of what it was. I, I was like, how did I get this contract? How did I get this placing? How did I get, am I that good? I'm, and I would never. I never wanted to believe that I was good enough to get that contract or good enough to get that placing. And it's, it's not yeah. until it's not until now I look back at pictures and I'm like, fuck, I was better than I thought in my own head. Yeah. I but to me, that, done. that drives me because I've, I've always had that in my entire life on a lot yeah. of different things, but that yeah. just means that I never get complacent to but me that's, personally. It's like constant, yeah. like oh, I have to constantly be better every single day. I'm, I'm like, and it, it's, yeah. and it, and it, I think it manifests in different ways for different people. Um, yeah. and then some people just use it to just beat the heck out of themselves and then they don't go anywhere with it or the people no, who are like never settle. Like I have to be better every single day because of X, Y, Z. But those two things aren't exclusive of each other. Mm. So I'm just as driven as you are. Right. Obviously I, I work really hard on the mm -hmm. podcast. I work really hard on my company. I worked really hard as a bodybuilder. Hani knows mm -hmm. I would, John used to tell me I worked too hard and I was yes. my own worst enemy. Yep. I'd agree. So, with that. so those two things aren't exclusive of each other. You can grind like a motherfucker mm -hmm. but but still not believe in yourself mm -hmm. right so it's like uh yeah it, it's not yeah the, the biggest issue right there the difference is austin is that when someone who has that imposter syndrome is when someone actually fulfills their goal and their purpose and then they talk themselves out of the trophy why mm -hmm. yeah 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 i didn't deserve the trophy that's I didn't deserve true. it. Yeah. And that's, that's that was the situation uh, with Fuad with a lot of different things at the time. And mm -hmm. it, like you said, it, you know, it's something that you've been working on and it's great that you're actually talking about it because I think that there's people listening to this that yeah. are going to relate to that. And what it ends up doing, which is very detrimental to your mental health, is that it actually starts to really pull you back and mm -hmm. you don't end up being able to mm -hmm. grow mm -hmm. because of the fact that you never allow yourself to take those those goals and those those medals and those things and saying yeah you did i did a great job mm -hmm. let me go ahead and do that now it doesn't mean that you're you have to sit there and, and be like complacent it just means that you have to sit down and say yes i'm going in the right you know the right direction i'm really growing i'm i'm whether it's as a bodybuilder or whether it's as a business person or whether it, it could be in anything and i felt like that was a situation where it was the counseling that you went through or the coaching that you went through or me working with you and uh, you know, whoever else you work with, with on that mental side, it's so important that you have that. And it's a balance issue because some people, again, due to insecurities will overcompensate and they'll talk shit and they'll say a lot yeah. of really bad things. I mean, I talked to him about it with Derek. I think Derek yeah. did some of that early on in his career. Derek's and, changed, changed like a complete 180. And that like was the, a, the, mm -hmm. the first podcast I did with him to the second completely different person. 
Yeah, I heard about that. I never saw the first podcast, and he's telling Dude. me he won't allow me to watch it, he said. Don't he watch said, it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he won't let me watch it, because I've heard that it was kind of a nightmare for some reason. I don't know what he said. I even said to him in the middle of our second podcast, I said, Derek, I don't know what you've done, man, but this is really refreshing, because you're a totally different person. And then he went into like how he, you know, he's... And I was actually going to touch on this when you were talking about um, why, like how I might be a little different now. Mm -hmm. This relates to Derek. Uh, Derek said that he learned to be more grateful mm -hmm. and he learned to focus more on his religion and his family and the things that were important in life and less on, if I can recall the, the podcast, less on just the goal of being Mr. Olympia and being popular and being important. It was kind of along those lines. Mm -hmm. And I think what I was, what I, how I'm relating it to my story is I think the reason I'm different now is I wasn't grateful then. Like I, I wasn't grateful to be a bodybuilder with a contract and just thankful that I was able to do what I loved. I just expected it yeah. like this, even though I had imposter syndrome, I expected this is where I should be. This is what I should be getting paid. It's weird. I can't explain how it, it's like I had this entitlement but also an imposter syndrome at the same time. But I think the difference is when you start to uh, level up is you start to just be grateful for things in your life. So like, I'm very like, if you take the, take the podcast, for example, or, or the business or hostile, whatever, when I have customers reach out or when I have fans reach out from the podcast and say how much it means to them or whatever it is, I'm very thankful. Like I would respond to everybody and I'm like very, appreciative of the support and it's like that i think reduces some of your imposter syndrome because you're trying to connect more yeah you're not i don't know if i'm explaining it properly when you have complete imposter syndrome i feel like you're disconnected from everything you're just like i was kind of like living outside my body i'm like i'm watching all this stuff happen i'm like no i don't deserve any of this when you become more grateful and more thankful for what you're doing I think you become back in your body and you become more appreciative of the things that are happening, more happening present. to you. More present is a perfect way to put it. And that's, that's a symptom of anxiety. Mm -hmm. Really, an really anxious people are never present. Oh. And that's why some people when they ask me like how my bodybuilding career went, I'm like, it's kind of a blur Yeah, because I was never present. I was always outside my body watching and that's where the imposter syndrome comes from. That's where the not believing in yourself comes from. That's, all of that is stems from that. Did you ever have any like actual tangible things that you had to start doing? Like some, so like if you, it could, what did it just like evolve over time or did you have I, some things that you actually well, started doing to fix that? Talk, so talking to Alvin Brown mm -hmm. for two years, I saw Alvin. Um, that was very helpful because he kind of gave me insight as to why I felt anxious, what it meant, what my feelings meant. And then reading a couple books, one of them that was very very good for me was the power of now by Eckhart Tolle was basically all about living in the present. So after reading that, it started to give me insight as to, you know, thinking too far ahead or thinking about things in the past are just going to leave you a uh, miserable all the time. Mm -hmm. So, um, those two things, just the biggest thing I would think I would say learning about my, it was learning about my anxiety, why I had it, how to, how to deal with it, where it stemmed from, Kind of all that and then just trying to put it in practice throughout the day your your brain is a muscle like anything else man you have to be very mm -hmm. conscious when you get anxious or when you're thinking too far ahead you know sometimes like if a, an event is coming up mm -hmm. you start thinking about it and you start building it up and it gets the, the mountain becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to the actual event happens and then it's like overwhelming but then you get to the event you're like oh that you're done and you're like oh that wasn't that big a deal i stressed about it for three weeks and then it was no big deal so I think chan like being conscious of that and trying to stay present instead of thinking about something that's happening three weeks from now helps reduce anxiety and also being prepared, like being prepared for things like, you know, some people say to me like, oh, how do you avoid the anxiousness for the stage? That was one of the reasons I was actually better with Hani is because, and better with John was my preparation was so honed in without very much guessing that I was able to stay more focused. So 
anyway, I, I can't really give you like a tangible, like this is how to fix your anxiety. Uh, for me, it was just really understanding and helped me learn how to deal with it. And it's a, it's a big question to ask, so we don't have to delve into it. You can choose to yeah. as much as you want to or as little as you want to. But I always find this curious when I talk to people about certain things, different types of mindsets. It, mm -hmm. it's, it can sometimes be helpful to some people to hear from somebody who's kind of been very successful yeah. and has experienced these things. You, again, choose to however much you want to delve into. But do you happen to have an idea of like where that stemmed from for you? All of that. Uh, you know what? I think, okay, so I was always a nervous kid. Mm -hmm. And steroids amplify everything. Right. So like, I'll give you an example. When I talk to Ian, I'm like, I never wear, uh, like tank tops to the grocery store, for example. And Ian's like, well, fuck I do. I'm like, why? He's like, I want people to know like what I worked for. And I'm like, I wear like a hoodie and I'm like, I'll ask my wife. I'm like, Hey, am I blending in? <laughs> no, you're, you're not, you're not blending in. You weigh 300, 300 fucking pounds. Uh -huh. Everybody can see you. So uh, I, I think just that nervousness that I always had compounded by taking steroids, which makes everything amplified in your life, made it all worse. And then to top it off, I'm 300 pounds. I got a Mohawk. Uh, and, you know, it's just like, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to blend in, but I'm not. It's like, it's, it's a really messed up because you would think somebody wants to blend in would not go be a bodybuilder and shave their head into a Mohawk and like all this stuff and drive fast cars. They would probably live a more <laughs> you, know, you, want, you know, which in but, itself is kind of an imposter syndrome of like you are wanting something else but doing something completely different, right? Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't know. It was, it was a mess. I, it's a walking <laughs> dichotomy. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's just what it is. Uh, but it's just, it, it is. It's, it's almost like you're dealing with that Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde in you. You know, everybody has that to some degree, but some, some people have it a little bit more so, especially when you have. Right anxiety insecurity and then you're trying to you know some people are so crazy because it's it's like they'll they'll they love it and they feed on it and they'll mm -hmm. stims will make them really anxious mm -hmm. but they almost that they want to even be more anxious because they're yeah. so used to being in that zone that they want to be in that zone and yeah. if you're taking gear and gears amplifying that or some people will do recreational drugs and make it even more so especially stimulants and then what will happen is it'll just they'll live in that zone and it's just they'll create yeah. mayhem around them and then they'll want to know well, why is my life so hectic and so crazy and why do i make bad decisions it's yeah i mean look i don't i don't i don't love getting into this but i do because inevitably there's always a number of emails that come from yeah. people that are like i was feeling that it's hard to put yourself out there and be vulnerable because you know social media is just like full of fucking trolls yeah but the reward of getting like you know, 10 or 20 people message me and say, Hey, that really helped is worth it. So I always try and whenever I get the chance, I try and talk about anxiety because I think a lot of bodybuilders actually suffer with it because most bodybuilders are introverts. Yeah. So it's kind of a symptom of it. And the anxiety is there for a lot of us. So I figured just talking about it helps a little bit. Yeah. And I think it gets amplified because of social media and everything else that comes along with it. Cause you always have to be perfect. You always have to be, yeah. whether you think it's that for the competition or whether it's like when you're not in competition and then you're trying to do it for your sponsors and, um, speaking of sponsorship, big, big talk <laughs> this last couple of days, man, I'm not going to, you know, yeah. hold it's back okay. here. Yeah. I, you had a couple of competitors, uh, that you sponsor and, uh, Justin and, um, Nate, Nate. And there was, you just made an announcement on social media a couple of days ago about it, yeah. um, about their parting. And there has been some talk about like, Hey, you know, you brought in quite a bit of athletes that come in, come out. I mean, specifically about this situation, is it kind of in line with everything else? Or was this a, were these two outliers? And is so, there a reason why they both happen at the same time? So they're both a little different. Okay. Uh, Nate's contract came to an end. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I don't like to get into too much detail on this stuff, but you know, it, I won't go too far into it. I guess what I'll say is Nate's contract had two years on it. Okay. Or actually it was a one year we signed him. He wasn't being paid by anybody. He was just kind of out there. So I'm like, come on board. We'll pay you, you know, took him on first year went by. Everything was good. Second year came around. I'm like, okay, maybe we should make some changes to the team. So I'm like, I don't think I told Ben, Ben is our athlete manager. Mm -hmm. I said to Ben, Ben Pagulski. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah he, he works he works for me now breaking news <laughs> i had to throw that in i'm sorry okay. just because you're be like that you're like now, now he works for me the yeah. guy that told me he had a green tan he works for me now <laughs> um no ben chow okay so i said to ben look he's got like a month and a half left on his contract maybe you should let him know now okay because you know i want him to be able to find another sponsor and you know get along you know just move along and be okay mm -hmm. so we let him know uh he wasn't very happy about it but i was like look it's just business it's numbers it's not personal we love you everything you've done for us is great we just kind of have to shrink the team a little bit mm -hmm. so that was it it was kind of the thing right and then um justin happened like a week after justin kind of let me know kind of a week after that he just wasn't happy so uh, when Justin, when Justin told me, I was like, okay, well that opens up a little bit of money in the budget. So I called Nate back and I said, you know, are you interested in staying on? We have a little bit of room in the budget. And Nate said, no, I'm, I think I'm, I'm going to move on. And I said, okay, so that's fine. So Nate, his contract basically ended and that was, that was, you know, us kind of letting him do sure. his own thing. Um, with Justin, I, you know, we have, we have a lot of obligations if you want to be a hostile athlete, we have a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Like you have to do YouTube videos. You have to post on social media. You have to come to events. You have to stand at a booth. I'm old school, man. Look, like, I don't know the way companies are doing things now. You have a company, yeah. you know, I don't know. I don't know how you do things at Eva gym with your athletes. I was an athlete. I remember doing videos for flex online for free. Yeah. And I did them week after week after week leading up to the flex pro right and after i did them they signed me to sign me to a contract i didn't go to them and say hey i'm doing a flex pro would you give me a bunch of money and i'm gonna fucking do some videos for mm -hmm. you no i did all the work and i earned my contract and then even after i got my contract there was things in that contract that i had to do or else i would be let go and the same thing happened at SciTech, and the same thing happened at muscle tech you know SciTech, we used to fly to europe we would stand at a booth for fucking four days straight or eight hours, eight hours a day. day. Yeah. Eight or nine hours a day. Like I did this shit. So nobody mm. can tell me that they can't do it. Right. Like, right. Cause I did it. So, uh, I expect the same from my athletes. You know, you have to do this. You have to do that. You know, and, and some people mm. don't mind it. Samson breezes through his contract. Like it's fucking nothing. He doesn't never complains. He's very thankful. Samson's gotten raise after raise after raise, and we are a very happy family. I don't think he'll ever leave. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, Justin, I don't know. Maybe he kind of wants to do his own thing. He wants to do something a little different. Maybe other companies don't have as many requirements, um, and that's fine. I, I don't, I don't blame him for wanting to go somewhere else if it's easier. But we are a, a new company, and we're growing. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, and I do my best to promote my athletes, whether it be through the podcast or anything else. And I expect the same in return. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't understand that sponsorships are not just you being a model anymore in the past, even with during muscle tech days, when they used to sign everybody, you used to be with them. Jay was with them. Phil was with them. And it was a lot of just go do a photo shoot and then they're going to run ads and flex magazine. And there's going to be before and afters. And whatever it was, it was, it was, it was structured. It was just structured differently. Then there was this gray period that occurred where it was more of the Instagram model. Let me just take a picture with a shaker cup and, yep. Yep. and make sure I have abs or let's just, I'm pumped up and I'm gonna have a pre-workout next to me. Yep. And now it, it, you have to go much further because people tune that shit out. And if people aren't, are disingenuous. They're really, you can, people can tell when people are disingenuous about a brand. Yeah. And I feel that, you know, when I designed Evagen, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I think you were one of my first guys that had a t-shirt on in Evagen. Yeah. I have a, there's an yeah. old picture. I think it's from the yeah. Flex Pro, right? And Maybe. I'm not sure. Yeah. And, and, and I just thought of that just now. And it's one of those things where people who are taking your products and they believe in your system and they believe in what you're putting in it, it people are going to tell whether or not you're full of shit and you're just cashing a check or not. And yeah, if yeah. you don't evolve with that, especially if you've been with a, a brand for more than a couple years, yeah, the, you have to evolve with being able to show the journey. 
and being yeah. able to con- create that connection and continue with that con- connection. And I've had a lot of athletes who have been I've been with for three, four, five, six years have been with me. And mm-hmm. um, in some ways, I feel I'm a little bit too soft when it comes to certain things. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, you know, that's why I let my athlete manager make a lot of the decisions now because sure. it's not, I'm not a really, I'm always going to be a little bit more of a like, oh, it's okay, you know, and yeah. I'll let that person be able to go ahead and run it the way it's supposed to be run. Because if someone's not doing their obligation, it's mm-hmm. like a job. Okay. That's if right. Austin doesn't go and post and doesn't do this and do, do that, there's going to be a problem. Right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> there's that, you know, you have a job, yeah. this is your job. So, yeah. and, and sometimes people go, Oh, you know, I'm, I just wasn't feeling it or whatever. And once in a blue moon, you know, you and I both know there's going to be times where there's somebody might go a little dark or go like this, but if it's a consistency is not there in general and there is a lapse, it's a lapse in performance. And yeah. it's about this. It's not just about how somebody does on stage anymore. In the past, it could have been like, okay, this guy wins the Olympias or this guy does this. And that's all we care about because we're just doing still images. Now it's consistency, consistency in content. Look at Seabom, right? Yeah. I mean, he's the yeah. epitome of that, whether yeah. it's on social media, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's on any of those things on those platforms that it's a holistic thing when it comes to the branding. And I feel that if you don't take it as a job, you're not going to be with one. You're not going to have one very, very long. It, yeah. it, it's about making sure that you're consistent. So when you look at your contract and that's just the bare minimum, mm-hmm. that's the bare minimum. And that's right. What that's what a lot of people don't understand. Well, to me, it's think, two different. My oh, sorry, you can go for it. No, no, no. Go ahead. I was going to say there's two different mindsets on it because I kind of came into managing and working in social media right when social media was starting to be monetized and people yeah. were becoming influencers. That's when I got into managing af- athletes, ambassadors, working in social media management. And I've seen kind of this wave. There's been kind of two major waves that have happened where there were those who had jobs, were personal trainers, were bodybuilders, but also had jobs, different things like that, that realized, oh shoot, I can make some money off of this, but they just took all of their skills from actually working jobs and having other obligations and just applied that same focus to social media where it's like, okay, if this is, it's like having an employer where it's like, okay, I have to meet these requirements. But then there was all of a sudden kind of like a second wave after this whole cushion. And it's some of those old people turning into this along Mm -hmm. with younger people coming up and not having ever experienced a lot of the nine to fives or jobs or obligations and just giving pretty much just being gifted a social media following because they look a certain way. And what's happening with that is there isn't that same obligation. There is not like, this is my job. It's your job. It's your livelihood. This is your job. You need to show up a hundred percent of the time and then do 120%. This is not something where it's like I can meet 60% of my obligations. And I did see a very, and also I do attribute some of it to a few major companies which I won't name, but whenever I was kind of managing contracts back in the day, I would hear from people coming from other companies where they would require like nothing, but people were getting these insane contracts. And so, yeah, they convol- uh, they made it to where people are like, well, I can get this yeah. much money somewhere and it ruins it for everybody else in a way. And half those companies that, are not even business they, anymore. Yep, they are. Yeah, no, they're not. That, that's the fucking problem. So I've heard of a couple other companies, which will remain on, which will remain nameless, that basically don't ask anything. Mm-hmm. You don't have to be, you don't have to do any YouTube videos. You don't have to do, you know, you don't just, I'll just pay you. You just wear our stuff on your Instagram and that's good enough. Look, that might be good enough. It's not good enough for me. So I'm not blaming anybody for not staying with hostile. I'm very, I'm the first one to tell you, if you come here, we expect a certain amount of effort because I give a certain amount of effort. Yeah. And you're giving them your platform, whether it's, whether it's podcast, whether it's YouTube, we are both doing that, right? That's right. I mean, That's we right. have over, how many f- um, subscribers do we have on our YouTube, Austin? Oh, I have to check. I think it's over 400,000 yeah, yeah, on YouTube. Yeah. For I mean, that's huge. Fusion. And and doing that, we spent millions of dollars to build up that platform to share with those so that, that we can help other, to uh, help athletes to kind of build them up. And it needs to be reciprocated because we're also paying you and we're putting you on the platform as well. So therefore yeah. you, you need to be able to build your own brand so we can help you, but you need to be able to continuously do that and be able to bring out content. And I think that when you become a certain level of athlete, you need to invest, whether it's a workout partner helping you shoot your videos. A lot mm-hmm. of times that happens or no, you, we, we, we pay, we pay for the videographers. 
Right. We do too, but there's yeah. some people that want to do it just kind of like extra, you know, like yeah. Derek, he has his videographer that he has as well. But yeah. if we need yeah. to turn around and, 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 and get extra stuff, we'll pay either his videographer or bring somebody else out. If we don't want to sure. bring, you know, shoot, you know, our guy, um, out yeah. there. But, but the whole point is that starting out wise, I'm talking about like just starting out, like just before you're even sponsored, being yeah, able yeah. to do those things and build, build up your own platforms and get those content going is very, very important to be able to get a sponsorship, but then keep and build a sponsorship. And like you said, with Samson, it was your example of saying, okay, now you've done this, you've proven yourself. So therefore we'll pay you more because you're doing more that's instead right. of saying, I'll do more if you pay me more. It's that's the problem. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So I think, um, I think the way it works is this back in the day. So when I got signed with muscle tech, mm -hmm. muscle tech probably did more advertising in magazines than any other company on earth. A hundred percent. Like there would they be a hundred plus pages of just ads. Yeah, yeah. They would take out like a 10 page section and it would be number of them yes. in Muscle Mag International, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how I gained some popularity. Mm -hmm. So they gave me the platform in yes. the magazines and they did a bunch of ads and they put me all over the place. I see podcasts like ours as the modern day magazine. We are giving a platform for people to find these people and get to know them. So my perspective on it is I'm giving you a platform to be known. We are a new company. You will reciprocate that love. And we also want you to build your own brand, but we have to build our brand at the same time. We are building, we're giving you the platform to grow. We're giving you the money that you're asking for. We, res, we, we expect something in return uh, for our company. So I think maybe hostile asks more than other companies. I don't care <laughs> because I, I know what, I know what athletes are. I know what athletes do all day. Mm -hmm. I know, I know what these guys are doing all day. I know, I know if I'm paying for a videographer, all that guy has to do is show up for his regular workout. Yeah. He doesn't have to do anything extra. Just show up right. and do your workout and let this guy film you. That's it. Right. So it's like, I know what people are capable of and what they're not capable of. And if I'm asking too much, then that's fine. I, if that's the per, if that's the reputation that hostile gets, I'm okay with that. It's, this is how the comp my company is going to run. I'm not, I'm not soft on athletes. I totally understand. Like, I don't expect them to travel when they're six weeks out from a show mm -hmm. or like, you know, I, but I understand that side of it as well, but there are certain things that I know can and should be done. And I, I won't, I won't kind of change my mind about it. So anyway, uh, long story short, I think. Like I said, Justin may have other opportunities that are better for him mm -hmm. and better suited suited to his lifestyle. And he wanted to get out of his contract. And I'm I'm friends with Justin. I think he's a good person. I think he's funny. We have great conversations. And I don't believe in holding my friend back. Like, you know, I'm not going to start a lawsuit with him and make him abide to his contract if he doesn't want to be part of the team. If he doesn't want to be part of the team, he's a friend. That's also a mistake I make. I, I become very close with my athletes. Yeah. So I always blend that friendship and work thing and i sometimes i wonder if i think you should do some coaching i think you should do some coaching so i can kick back and i can just call you <laughs> and laugh a little bit and no, be like I think you as the coach how come you never no, did that talk to me about that how come i never did coaching yeah i did i did i coached for a long time oh you did yeah but never seriously i coached people here and there and okay. i had some i had some success and ultimately i just couldn't do it because i i don't number one i thought other things were more important and mm -hmm. i didn't want to wait, have the time and two i didn't have the patience right you gotta have a lot just, of patience. Like, think about <laughs> think about the patience you had with me, <laughs> and then and then me trying to have that patience with someone else is never gonna happen. I should have got a I'm Nobel not, Prize. I, <laughs> I should have got a Nobel I, Prize. <laughs> I think I think um, I think one of the keys to coaching is honestly being patient and being understanding of persons a person's life and mental state. And I just didn't have, I was an X and O's guy. Like, yeah. send me your diet. This is what you got to do next. Don't talk to me till three days from now or whatever. Right. And I don't think that makes a successful coach. I think to be at the very top, like you did, honey, I think it's, how are you doing? How's your mind state? How's this? How's that? How's your wife? How's your kids? How's your, yeah. and you put it all, and you put it all together into this perfect package. Yeah. That's what you're trying to do when you're trying to drive towards, you know, perfection. You never get to perfection. You're just trying to create to try to pave the road and make it frictionless as possible. And yeah. every aspect of someone's life 
that can cause that friction needs to be just really, really in check. And if you do that, you're going to be able to create a lot better result at the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not, I didn't, I just ultimately for after a little while, I, I just didn't want to take people's money if I couldn't give them the amount of effort someone like you was giving. Right. Because if you, I don't know if you remember back in the day, but like when Chad would coach, mm -hmm. when Chad coached me, there was no phone calls. It was like, here's your diet, send me your photos. I'll talk to you next week. Right. And and we had good success. I got my pro card. I did well at a couple of shows. Like it was, it was fine, but that was how I learned to coach. So I would do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But then there became, then there came um, a period of coaching after that where people started to give their clients their phone number and like, call me at night if you have any problems and let's talk about your personal life. And I was like, I don't, I'm not used to this, man. I can't, I can't be involved in everybody's personal drama and their own. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, the wanna, idiot that does that. I'm the idiot that does that. <laughs> I'm like, I have my own fucking yeah, problem story. But I'm yours like, too. <laughs> you should have just dumped on them you know, before you can get into yours. <laughs> <laughs> they call and I call like, them. Okay. <laughs> he's like, what are you doing? Stop calling me. Go every, eat your every, so if we had your coach, he's going to start dumping on you yeah, before I'm you stump get, dumping on him. And it, you're like, I can hear that. Like, hey, honey, uh, how was that call, coaching call with Fuad? And he's like, <laughs> fuck me. And he just, I, I feel more depressed after I got Yeah, but, but I'll feel better. Yeah, and, then they'll, and then they'll never call me again. It'll just be on all, it'll be perfect. This is a perfect, the perfect introvert, introvert coach. No, just but like, no, but I, <laughs> No, but honestly, that was it. I, I, the coaching, the entire coaching business turned more into the, uh, the overarching, you know, X's and O's plus life. And right. I just wasn't, I wasn't cut out to be that, that kind of coach. So I was like, ah, I think it's not my thing. You have to know, you have to know where your strengths and weaknesses are, man. I, I, I knew I wasn't going to be cut out to be that guy. So I just didn't push it any further. Yeah, because you had a certain standard that you understood because you've worked with several people to be able to understand yeah. like where where that goes. Yeah. But yeah. Um, also I think that just the other thing about it is the fact that when you were training, like I remember you came to San Jose, right? And we yes. were training together. You would just annihilate the, the workouts, right? And yeah. now looking back at the pictures that you mentioned, talk to me about masters, man. Cause you said something to me that you were like, you get a little twinkle in your eye about what? about when we were at the Arnold and you're like, oh, I heard, you know, I said, the Masters are coming up. And you're like, oh, I'll, I'll, so you're going to do it? He's like, only if, what? <laughs> only if you would coach me. <laughs> All right. Thousand comments underneath. The I want to, yeah. I want to, I want to torment you one more time. <laughs> <laughs> he misses me. He misses me. Oh my God. I'm going to have to, no, I'm, I, I'm, then I'm going to call summer and I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to, she's going to have to be my counselor. I'm going to be like yeah, summer. Exactly. She's like, he does the same thing to me, honey. <laughs> I have the most patient wife on the hundred percent on the, the face of the earth. The, the, she's like the mother Teresa of bodybuilding <laughs> I, to I be know. able to, no. yeah. You, between your wife and my wife, they got it to be able to deal with our yeah. personalities. Um, you know what? Uh, I would, I would love to do the masters cause I never got to like hang it up the way I wanted to, but it would never happen. Cause I, it's still going to be disappointing. I have a tear in every muscle. I just look like a bag of shit. Like <laughs> it's just not gonna, it's just not gonna be pretty so i'm like there's no there's no way i would honestly love to i still got it like i still i still have the drive you still have it. the itch yeah like i still love training like crazy man like and i could put myself through a prep and get shredded but i just my physique just won't look the way i want it to look so there's no point but we still train fucking hard like me and paul still go in the gym and like oh don't get me started about paul bro Paul, what, like, I would, Listen, Paul, Paul, we gotta bring Paul, gotta, we gotta bring Paul onto this podcast. Because, Paul's got a huge fan base now. Okay. And they Paul, are loyal. Paul, they are loyal motherfucker. Paul, we, we can tell, dude, I have stories that you don't even remember about Paul. I don't remember. I have a worse memory in the world. Dude, Paul, there's, we gotta get him on the podcast one of these days. Okay. Okay. And, and because, we, yeah. because, and I'll tell a story because he was work, is he still working as a, at the border? Yeah. Yeah. He's got, he's got like five years left. Then he yeah, can okay. retire. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. There were some stories about Paul and, um, and his, his dreams, <laughs> Paul's <laughs> his dreams. <laughs> His gay dreams. Yeah, <laughs> what? Yeah, Paul. Yeah, tell it's the story, a, Fuad. I, I I don't know. No, there's no story. It's from the podcast. We did. No, I'm not telling the story. <laughs> <laughs> you brought it up. I just I said no. I didn't bring it up. You brought it. I said dreams. dreams. You you know you mentioned the fact yeah. that there were gay dreams, and I just <laughs> said it was funny because of the story about the podcast. How you brought it up, and you was trying to. I don't, I don't remember who else was on the podcast. I don't know if it was Ian or who else was on there, but I dude. It was Ian. Ian and Guy. I think Ian and Guy. Oh my. <laughs> 
Paul is, um, Paul, listen, honestly, Paul is, is like, I think what everybody should aspire to be. He is honestly the most selfless. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. Yeah. He just, yeah. He's a great fucking person. I'm lucky to have Is, is he a partner with you on the shows? No, I just, you know, I don't really have a co-host, man. I just, these guys are my friends. And no, 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 no. Your bodybuilding shows. What do you mean my bodybuilding show? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Food Abbey Championship. Yeah. yeah. It's me, me and Paul run the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With yeah, we've been special doing, guest we've been doing... Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did it. We started 13 years ago. Uh-huh. And 13 years ago was like in the middle of my prime. And Paul was, you know, just an amateur judge. So they were like, yep. the C- the CPA at the time was yep. like, we want to give you a show because you're a pro or whatever. So we called it the Food Abbey Championships. Mm-hmm. But now Paul is more popular than I am. So we might have to change the name to the Paul Classic. You know, the <laughs> Paul Classic. The Paul Classic. <laughs> and it just happens to be, isn't it next week? Yeah, it's next Saturday. So let's give a shout out to that show. So Fuad Show, if you're anywhere in the area, because I think Detroit's not far from you either, right? Well, we're also, no, we're doing it in Toronto. This one's in Toronto. We oh, have one okay. in Windsor. We have one in Windsor as well, but this one's in Toronto. Okay. And we're actually doing a live podcast uh, after prejudging as well with Ian, Melissa, Guy, Mike Van Wick. Okay. Uh, so we're all going to sit there and do a live podcast for the audience. So anyway, tickets are on sale. We had Abby at championships.com. Thank you, Hani, for letting me plug that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Send me a link. Yeah. I'll have Tim post it up too. Discount code, sure. Hani. Yes. I'm just joking. Discount, <laughs> sure, no discount code. I want to, I got to get a sports car like Hani. I don't have. <laughs> what are you Hani's talking got, about? You got all the cool shit. Hani's got, Hani's got all the toys. I have no toys. So I got to fucking catch up. Dude, you got to, what do you have? You have, you got a truck. I sold my, I sold my sports cars, man. I just have, a, I have two motorcycles now. I, what about the truck? I have the truck. I have a Raptor. Okay. A, uh, yeah. Oh, there you That's go. So you have a fucking McLaren or some shit. No, I don't have a McLaren. Oh, just a, but, but do you yeah. have the Vi- do you have the Viper still? I still have the Viper. I got a, you know a couple of other cars too. <laughs> <laughs> like how yeah, you have a Raptor. He's about to start listing them. <laughs> I have a Raptor, <laughs> and then he just started trailing off. Yeah, yeah, I have a Raptor. My daily's a Raptor. I've had a Raptor he's got, now he's, for he's six got years. A, he's got a Viper, a GTR. What else you got? Tell me. GT3 touring and you one and then I got okay, some, okay. <laughs> some other stuff. Like I said, there's no discount yeah, I code. I gotta stuff. catch up. I gotta no. catch up to Hottie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well you didn't you didn't need, also didn't fit in those sports cars anymore too for a while because you were getting too big. I, I remember I remember I wanted a Viper GTS yeah. when they came out in twenty fourteen or whatever the fuck it was. Yeah. I mean the Viper was always there, but the new style yeah. when it came out in twenty twelve, thirteen, fourteen, somewhere in there. Mm. I remember going to the dealership with Summer and I Get in the fucking, I was in 2014, I was still like 300 pounds. Yeah. I get in the car and I'm like, and it's manual and I sit in there and I'm like, Summer, look, it's fucking perfect. I fit. And she goes, close the door. Yeah. So I fucking close the driver's side door and I'm like, I'm like this. I'm like, this is no fucking way. I had to like, so I couldn't, couldn't fucking take the Viper, but it was good until I closed the door. So yeah, she's driving around with the door <laughs> open, <laughs> just open it. Go just Wrangler style, take the doors off. Well, that's yeah. one of the reasons why the actually they got rid of the Viper um, after the twenty fifth anniversary. Twenty uh, fifth anniversary because my mine's the last one, the last year. You um, have the ACR, right? Yeah, the ACR of the final edition. And what it was was that I guess there was the mandate for the side airbag was that yeah. year that was coming up, so they couldn't. They never engineered a, a side airbag; it wouldn't fit. So yeah, yeah, and it was yeah. the same kind of frame and body for 25 yeah. years. And then obviously yeah. the last one with the ACR, it's got a ton of arrow and it's a great car and it sticks and it doesn't yeah. get sideways like all the other ones did. And it's a great track car, but it just doesn't have any room for side airbags. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. so they knew that it was going to be done. And now with the chargers and the, um, and the challengers, uh, the final calls now also for the gas motors. So all yeah. the Hemis and everything else, they're, they're, all gone. they're all gone after this year. It's completely done. So is your ACR, that has like all the track records, right? Yes. But yes. I heard it's absolutely horrible to drive on the street. Yes. It's really is tough. It? Yeah. If you live in an area where it's got really smooth roads, it's not bad. You're so, good. Yeah. But I would literally only travel to the track with it and that's it. And yeah. you can drive it on the track. So it was a race car with license plates. And yeah, yeah. that's it. And you could even change the setting. And then if you added the spoiler when you got there and everything else, then you have to take it off because you're not going to be able to go through a driveway to get a gas at a gas yeah, station yeah, yeah. because you're going to smack that front lip and it's going to break in half. And yeah. so you wouldn't be able to do it. So you just basically, and then at sometimes when I was really trying to be like lazy, cause I just didn't want to drive it. 
I would just call up, uh, you know, the guys that would just sh- come over here and pick it up and then they, they would drop trailer it, it and I would yeah. pull up in the Raptor at Laguna Seca and then yeah. I'd get out of the Raptor, go on the track and then track and then just jump back in the Raptor, drive home and have it delivered back home. And, yeah. Yeah. and that yeah. was, and that was the way to do it. Yeah. But you got a, the GT3 is a nice daily driver, isn't it? Yes. You can, the GT3, yeah. especially cause I like driving the manual cause it makes it feel yeah. like you're going much, much faster. Yeah, and of then, course. And the GT2 was pretty good like that too, but it was yeah. n- just not as, because it's sterile, because it's a PDK. And, yeah, yeah. And it's so fast. But um, that was a cool car too. But I mean, you're into cars, you know. And you're, well, you're like driving more bikes now. I, I Honestly, man, I started riding. I've always wanted to ride motorcycles. And I started riding last year. And I was like, this is the best fucking thing ever. It's amazing. Yeah. I, I'm like, I don't even care. I actually have a the new Corvette Z06 ordered. Okay. I ordered it last year and it's taking forever because of fucking supply chain, whatever else. But, um, I don't even care if it comes in. Yeah. I'm just like riding around my, my motorcycle every day. So I don't know. You feel like you're going a lot faster. You don't have to go fast. And out there are the roads safe. I mean, do people even look around for bikes? Because a lot of places they don't look around for bikes and then they just, yeah. you know, change lanes and then you get somebody in a minivan and knock on wood. It's been, this will be my second summer. I, I mean, I haven't been, like I said, I got my license last year in May. So, oh, so you just my, got it. Okay. Yeah. I rode all, I put about 10,000 kilometers on between the two bikes. Wow. That's all, that's all the riding I've done. And so, they're sport, they're, they're, what do you call bikes? Cruiser bikes, right? Uh, they're not. Yeah. They're Harley one. Yeah. They're both Harleys. Okay. And, uh, so it's, I'm too scared to get a sport bike, man. I don't trust myself. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, this is only my second season, but luckily I've had no issues with people driving or anything like that. Yeah, that's what I was always afraid of. That's why I never rode bikes because I was just, I was the same way. I didn't trust myself because I like speed. And then at least with a car, you have metal surrounding you. Um, And when you're on a sport bike, you you drive aggressively like you would do in a sports car. And so it's one of those things that if somebody just doesn't see or look over, you get, you know, but I I think on the cruisers, you're definitely safer, but you just got to be really careful. Well, that's why I, did, I didn't get a sport bike because I'm like you, like I want to go fast. So yeah. I know if I have it, I'm going to use it. But on the Harleys, it, they're not really, they're not fast bikes. So they're more like just your, just your seated, your sitting position and everything is just more chill. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Uh, you still obviously run the danger of other cars, but you're not on there ripping around, like going super fast or nothing. Harley's going all electric too. You know that? I know. I'm never committed to that. Bike. They committed to I don't, you know, 100% electric. I'm like, Look, you know, honey, so I can't deal with that for one reason. I'm not against electric, whatever you think about it. That's fine. Part of the, part of the joy of driving a car is the sound. Yes. Or, or a motorcycle. Like when I got my Harley, it had stock exhaust on it. First thing I did was change the exhaust. Like I can't imagine driving an electric car and no matter how fast it is, not hearing anything. Yeah. It just doesn't. Have you ever driven a Tesla before? No, the only electric car I've ever driven is, uh, my brother has a Tesla, I've never driven it. The only electric car I've driven is, uh, I almost bought, bought that Ford Lightning and it okay. sucked, so I didn't buy it. <laughs> oh, you drove it and it sucked? I mean, driving it was cool, but I'm like, I wanted to tow my bikes and the towing distance was like a hundred miles. Right. Like, where the, like, where where the fuck am go? I going? <laughs> That's right. So I was like, I'm not buying this fucking thing, I'll buy a regular truck right. and I can tow my, tow my bikes wherever I want. Well, but, uh, no, I've never driven like, uh, anything fast, like a Tesla or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, they're fast. I mean, Austin has a Tesla, um, and I've driven the one right below the plaid and yeah. super fast, but I'm the same way. I can't handle, yeah. you know, there's not having vi- noise. I got there's it. A vis- there's a visceral feeling of driving a manual. It depends on what you like- want it for, because I had a manual Mustang right before, which exhaust yeah. down on it was extremely loud. You could hear yeah. every time you just tap the pedal, went up two miles an hour, you could hear it. And yeah, then yeah, I got yeah. in, and then I got in the Tesla for the first time, and I was like, "Gosh, I can whisper. And the person next to me can hear me. <laughs> like you can whisper in the car, but yeah. it's just it's just for different things. Like I miss that for like yeah. fun driving and everything. But honestly, sometimes if I'm getting in the car to go to the grocery store at night, I don't want yeah. to necessarily turn it on and wake up the entire neighborhood, and then no, just like get back in. Like so, it's super fun. Fuad and I They're would. Different. We don't care. <laughs> <laughs> we sometimes, just <laughs> sometimes I don't want to hear that. It's, it's so, but I miss it right now because it's been a few years with the Tesla and I miss it. But it, it's just it's just different. I don't I I consider that like a daily. But I'm not in the place yeah. right now to have a daily and <laughs> a fun car. That yeah. So that's that like idea, quiet. Yeah. And, that would be the ideal. Yeah. You'd have a day daily. If I could I could do electric daily and then 
have like a fun car that I could do. Because you get used to the fact you walk up and it unlocks. You walk away, it locks itself. It's never, you don't have to ever turn it on. You can turn on the AC from wherever. Like there's no, you know, you get spoiled with certain daily things. Austin doing this is hard. It's a pain in the butt. I know. I just, I know. I just let my uh, millennial slash Gen V, Gen Z show there. Totally. But you get spoiled with it and it's nice. No, no, I understand. Listen, I had, I had a, I had the Cadillac Escalade with the Super Cruise on it where it drove itself. Yeah. And I used to get on the 401 to drive to Toronto and I'd press Super Cruise and it would just drive me there. And, uh, I got used to it as well. It's stupid how like the little dumb things that you get used to that you don't actually, actually need, but no, it's, because once you have them and you have to go back, then you're like, I kind of missed well, that. Because I, my, my wife gets mad at me all the time because I hop out of the car when we're driving hers because she's got a BMW yeah. and I'll walk away and she'll just stand there and stare at the car <laughs> and be like, what did you forget? The car's still running because yeah. I just didn't push the button to turn it off. But it's like you get used to just walking away from your car. Shuts off, so in, off. So in a Tesla, you can just get out and walk away. And yeah, you just, just get up, walk away. It detects your phone is left and it just locks itself and shuts down. Incredible. Maybe I should get one. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think as long as you like the fact that it's quiet, if you like that and you like the fact that it can drive itself and... And the speed is nuts. Yeah. I mean, it's like like playing a video game. It's like playing a video game. It's like cheat codes because you literally put all the power down. It's all wheel drive. You jump on it. I think the only thing that I would get is I would get... I I don't even like putting gas in my cars, right? Like when I, I always like, oh man... Babe, you want to go ahead? You want to drive? You want to drive the truck today so that she can go put gas in it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, get that's fairness, so dude. That's what I do. I'm like, hey, by the dude, way, come on. Are you serious? Oh man, it's like no time. You know? I don't do that. I I had, when I had wife. Adriel back in the day, when in California, Adriel, you know, he was one of my uh, just really good guys that that was always helping at Evagen and everything. And he was so into cars; he still is. And he goes to every cars and coffee, and he does everything. I would be like, "Hey, Adriel, there's a low 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 tank, and you know, there's low gas." And and he's like, "Okay." I'm like, "And by the way, can you get it washed while you're out?" And and he loved <laughs> driving the cars, so he would just jump in the Porsche, or he would just you know jump in the Raptor, and he would go get it taken care of. And then I would leave the office at sometimes eight or nine o'clock at night, and then I'm like, yeah. "Oh, perfect! I don't have to go out there and get gas yeah. and worry about it." Bonnie's hinting at things right now. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, like I said, it's it's actually nice because I'm only. 12 minutes away from the house to the office. Yeah. So it's so yeah. close that I don't have to drive far. And, uh, but it's funny because on, on the trips, when I come back now, because there's a full tank of gas, I'm like, yes, I don't have to put gas in the car. I ain't <laughs> gas in that damn car. But she's, she's also a gearhead. So she went and, I mean, when she started driving, my wife started driving the GTR as a daily. The first thing she did the first week is she put exhaust on the car. Is she a gearhead, really? Yeah. Big time. She's, she dailies the GTR. She's got 80,000 miles to put on the GTR. Really? Yeah. Yeah, she she started know. driving it because she was like, "Hey, I want to just like kind of maybe do my own sports car thing." I said, "Sure." She's like, "You know, I want to try to. Um, do you mind if I try the GTR?" Because I wasn't really tracking it anymore, yeah. and because I was always worried that when cars get older, they break. And yeah. yeah, so I go, you know, yeah, go ahead. And then next thing you know, she's like, "Yeah, just she just left her car parked, and she had an infinity." What kind of, what- Oh, I was going to say she, she had, had a G, she had an Infiniti uh, G thirty seven S convertible, yeah, yeah. like convertible yeah. hardtop. Yeah, and yeah. so it's in the same family. It's still made by Nissan. Yeah, but she's like, "Oh, this is way faster." I'm like, "Yeah, it's a fucking GTR, yeah. <laughs> right?" <laughs> you know. But and uh, and then like the first week, I think she got like fifteen or twenty kids that were pulling up next to her with like camera phones. You know. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. This was like I don't know, ten, twelve years ago, and she would just turn around and and then she's been driving it ever since and. Everyone would just turn around and just pull up with a camera phone and they just love the GTR and it would get wrapped and then um, she had even, you know, written all over it. And some first week, you know, she went in into the shop and she's like, oh, I'm going to take it into the shop. And I was like, okay, I didn't even think twice about it. I thought maybe she needed, it needed an oil change. And then it yeah. comes back and I hear this, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> what'd you do? And she's like, how can you never put an exhaust on that car? Oh, and I go, God. what do you mean? Is that, did you just pull up and she's like, yeah, yeah. I just took it to your tuner guy. And yeah. I just told him to put this exhaust on there. And then she put the exhaust on and she's like, well, why didn't you ever do it? And I said, because it would blow sound because Laguna Seca and then the tracks up in Northern California, they had a low limit of sound. So oh, you couldn't, you couldn't have a no, like, loud exhaust. No, no, uh, especially Laguna. Cause it had like a 91 decibel was the limit on most of the days. So yeah, but it would, sorry, but that, that ACR has to be louder than that. No, no. No, so with the ACR, sure. w- because of the side exhaust, y- yeah. all you had to do is go throttle neutral and, and yeah. go up the hill, 
and you're yeah. passing the sound station, you don't have to worry about blowing sound. In the GTR, what would happen is you, you know, you keep momentum going. And then yeah. if you are even in stock, I got a blue sound once stock because it yeah, was yeah, yeah. cloudy. And then what would happen was the sound would resonate against the clouds, come back. And then all of a sudden you get in black flagged. And if you get sure. two black flags, then you're basically done for the day. Oh, fuck. Yeah. So you're done for the day. And then you're like, holy shit, I'm done for the day. Why would, that sounds so stupid that you would have sound restrictions. Like, restrictions at a track well, yeah because of the homes near it and laguna is in a close by, yeah. right it's it's this yeah. hill you know this monterey valley and it's been contested for years where they're literally trying to shut the track down or doing any uh, of those things so they have a very low limit the only times where it's um practically unlimited is during the race weekends for carmel you've heard of monterey car week when we go yeah. to Monterey car yeah. during that week yeah. where they have the historics and they have all the vi uh, the old uh, AC Cobras and Ferraris yeah. and, and everything else, then it's just, they, they go nuts. Cause it's, yeah, yeah. it's, it's unlimited, but there's only certain amount of weekends that have that during the whole year. And then, yeah. and then the other days it's 91. And then if they track providers or are renting it and they want to pay the extra 10 or 20 grand for the day, they can go to 93. And then, okay. so there's, there's different levels, but mostly 91. And it's yeah, so yeah. low. It's almost, I think it's even lower than like what it's supposed to be on the street. It's something wow. ridiculous. And so anyways, that's why I never put an exhaust on that what? car. Have you been to Eagles Canyon? In not Dallas, yet. In Texas? Not yet. Michael actually invited me out there. Yeah. He and, took me out there. How was it? It's well, I've never, I don't, I've never driven on a track like that. Like I've driven on a couple tracks, but they're not that like professional kind of okay. thing. Right. So I had an amazing time. He put me in the car with like the professional driver. I think that owns the track. I can't remember his name. Okay. And, uh, he let me sit in with him around the track. Did you drive and, or no? Yeah. He let me sit in with him okay. Then I drove by myself and then he let me drive with him. And I think it was a GT four he mm -hmm. has or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I've never driven a car like that in my life. He would, he, cause he was just sitting right there going, Okay. And, and, you know, they have like the numbered cones leading up to the turn. Yes. I don't know if they had that. Up. So he would be like, okay, I want you to break it cone four and then whatever, whatever you give me instruction, and I would do it. And then the next time around, he'd be like, okay, break it cone three. Then we'd be like, break it cone two. And I'm like, what the fuck? The two is like right at the turn. Yeah. And I'm like, I've never, I never knew a car could do what it does, what, what he showed me and what he had me do in that car. That's awesome. I was like, this guy is, he's like, he's like, when he drove first, he's like, are you going to get scared or are you okay? Are you car sick? I'm like, no man, let it, let it rip. And it's still, I was, cause I love going fast, but I could not believe the brake pressure, the turning pressure, the just the high revs that he put this car through. I'm like, I didn't think a car could deal with this without just falling apart. Yeah. He's like, no, he's like, no man. He's like, these cars are built for this. He's like, okay, it's your turn. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So it was probably honestly one of the best experiences of my life. I, I absolutely loved it. Yeah. That, that but, track is the one that I've heard was really nice. And it's like, I think like you said, it's a private track. Michael, uh, invited me to go and I couldn't, I was traveling the week that he invited me, but, yeah. but at Laguna it's, it's like that on steroids because you have that big six it's story. Huge drop. Hill. Yeah. You have yeah. the you yeah. know, corkscrew, which is a six story is that drop. Six six stories yeah it's a six story because they have because they have a drop like that at eagles canyon but it's not i don't think it's six stories yeah it's, it's very very hilly up in that northern california yeah, yeah. and so you have that great drop and it's like a blind drop and then you have to like yeah. aim for a tree and you just kind of look at it and stay in and praying yeah. and so we have like three world-class tracks up in northern california but it was really cool but i want to definitely do that and porsche is a great car because you could beat the shit out of it and yeah. it's designed to do that but if you go out there with a Mustang, yeah. it's got way too much motor for not enough suspension yeah. and not enough, yeah. not enough brakes, unless it's like a Shelby. Like I had a 350R, but even that eventually broke too. <laughs> yeah. Broke that I had, car. I, I had that car. Horrible car. Horrible street car, but great yeah. car. Yeah. Um, I, uh, so Michael, and for people that don't know, we're talking about Michael from the owner of Gasp. Um, he was telling me like, if, if I wanted to do that, he's like, get a Miata. Yes. He's like, get a Mazda Miata. He's like, the upkeep is, the maintenance is cheap. Yes. You can beat the piss out of it all year round. You can drive it till it's full max capability while you're learning before you get in, into anything faster. Yeah. I mean, there's so, people like my best friend races in the C series for SCCA in that, and he's won the series. Yeah. And it's, they're great cars because 
they have great handling for braking versus um, yeah. uh, the speed. And yeah. it's so well balanced. So they have entire race series with, with Miatas. Miatas. Yeah. yeah. So well, I just think if you're learning, there'd be no point in getting something so fast that you can't fucking handle it anyway. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So like a Miata, Miata sounds kind of like a good start for somebody who doesn't know how to drive. Cause I think, I think, uh, Michael has one. They have one for gasp. Okay. It's a Miata that he's, that he uses when he goes out there. So there's pro drivers that still use Miatas because, because again, they're nine tenths through the turns yeah. and they're, yeah. Yeah. they really know, and they still at that level. So it's not just a beginner yeah. car, but you have advanced yeah. people who drive the shit out of those things in, and on track days. Yeah, you're right. When I, when I was there, actually, uh, the, the professional driver I was driving with kept pointing out this Miata that was going around the track. It was the 17 year old prodigy. And he was like, watch this kid drive. And he, the kids just fly. Like, I never seen anybody drive a Miata like that. This thing's fucking just all out through the turns. It just like, you never hear like the exhaust, like you never hear the throttle come down. He's just right. It's all the way yeah. through, all yeah. the way yeah. through. Yeah. So, so like you said, it's not just beginners, but yeah. yeah. Uh, one and that's day, called no fear. Day. Those younger guys are no fear. I could do that on a track. You got to do think. it, man. You got to do it. We got to, you got to come down here. We got to figure, get together and go do the track day with Michael. I'm supposed to be down there, uh, June 21st through 24th or something like that. Well, hit me up. Let me know. That's when you're, that's when you're kicking off your master's Olympia prep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> got it. Okay. That's <laughs> understood. Got it. <laughs> those those guys uh, we should we were i know we were going to talk about it the only thing i'll say about the masters real quick before we go mm -hmm. is i think they should have offered more if they wanted to get bigger names a more money you mean I, yeah because i think what's the main what's the what's first place like so 20 it's or 20 it's 20 grand mm. for yeah. the open and every other division i believe is 10 and so yeah, but i don't think 20 is going to get somebody like evan senapani off his couch i i agree with you but do you think evan senapani even wants to come off his couch no, but I think even if like you took Victor Martinez, for example, if, right. like you said, Hey, Hey, it's 80 grand or 50 grand. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Like somebody that, that would definitely still go on. Cause I don't think Evan's competed in a while. Has he? No, no, no. I'm not saying Evan, Evan hasn't competed. No, no, no. You're just talking about bigger names. You're talking about just bringing yeah, bigger names. I'm just talking like, yeah, some, some guys that maybe would bring some nostalgia back to the, to the, to the sport. Because, you know, people love these old, the older names. I, I keep saying older names. I'm one of that generation, but like people like Victor, people like Evan, people like Seth, people mm -hmm. like these, like Seth's already in fucking contest shape anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So Seth. it's like, maybe if they Seth made Seth's it. mental. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to see him next week. I'll see him next week when we're in Pittsburgh. Yeah. He's crazy. So these guys, who knows, maybe if it was 50, 60, 70, 80 grand, they'd be like, all right, you know what? I'm going to jump in and take home a check. I don't know. Yeah. Not I mean, that there's, not that there's bad bodybuilders doing it. I mean, Phil Kohar is great. Ken, Ken Jackson, like, you know, Fred Smalls, like there's some good, good names doing the show. It's not that it's just, it would bring more. I think if they, if they really, you know, increase the prize money enough to, for people, because you know, guys who leave, if you want them to come back, you have to make it worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that you got to just be careful when you're at that age too. And some of the guys that, feel like that they've i know branch has said that many times like he dodged a bullet already right like at that level yeah. for that long yeah. so yeah. therefore yeah. do you really want to go back and tempt fate so yeah i mean look like one of the things you think about is uh josh lenarowitz mm -hmm. you know josh you know dealt with a lot mm -hmm. and he got away i think you know with his health as far as i know as far as like i've seen online so who knows is this like a bad idea or not i mean only he knows right but yeah, I guess that's a good sentiment too. That that branch says like, you know, you've done enough to your body. Why, why are you doing more when you're 45 or 50? Right. So Just, I think that's how you have to think about it. And then you have other people like Vinny Galani who maybe didn't get all of the accolades that he felt he should have, or he could have, but maybe now he stayed in shape and maybe that's something that can be. But know, is that, is that, you know, I, I think everybody has different, uh, viewpoints on what success is, but mm -hmm. like. I don't know. I don't think winning the Masters Olympia would make me feel any better about my open career, bro. You and your personality, you could win the Open <laughs> Olympia. You're, you're not like, here. You're everything like, that we like, just <laughs> talked about, we just had a whole podcast on this subject. Dude, you just literally <laughs> made my point. On a, on that note, and on that note, I don't think I'd be happy. With it. Yeah, we just <laughs> talked about that. Who won the Masters Olympia? Yeah. He's literally. 
and, then, yeah, well, we, and we just talked about how he just got better. He just went into relapse. Mode. I'm an I'm an overachiever. What do you want from me? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Unreal, unreal. But bro, thank you so much for spending the time. Uh, time just completely flew. I don't know how long it's like. At least an hour and a half, right? And two uh, out, two hours. Yeah, I think is it? Two. Is yeah, it? It's I mean, yeah. So thank you. Uh, really, always great catching up with you, man. You yeah, know. man. I love I love talking to you, honey. We always have a good time. Yeah, it's really. Do you really want to do you want to tell people really quick why you were mad at me? About what? You come on. You just which time? I thought I thought we had a really nice heart to heart in in Columbus, uh -huh. and I think I think people should know. You don't I, remember? No. So on my podcast, I blab uh -huh. a lot, uh -huh. and I say a lot of things, and sometimes I blab so much that I get myself in trouble. And I think one day we were talking about Hani and somebody was asking what the special sauce was. And I said, there is no special sauce. Hani just knows how to, he doesn't do anything special. He just knows how to make people do more or get more from their physique or something. I said something like that. Yeah. I, now I remember. Yes. I and, think it was and, you and Jay Cutler. I think it was, it was, it was yeah. like something where you and Jay were talking about something in 09 or, or something along those lines. And Hani was mad at me and I didn't even know it. No, I just said... It's funny because you said it's not, it's not something special, but he knows how to get the best, most out of the athletes, out of his athletes. And I said, well, that's what's special. <laughs> and I'm like, I was like sour grape syndrome. But, but, but the context in which I said it uh -huh. was when it comes to diet, supplementation, yeah. training, uh -huh. I don't feel like there's any magic tricks. Absolutely. But- that's why I said the second part was he knows how to get the most out of his athletes. Cause that is the special part. Yeah. But I meant like, cause people are always thinking like, Oh, what does his diet look like? It's gotta be some special thing. Right. Or, or it's like, a he's special, gotta, it's special. He's gotta be protocol, doing like, or it's something. Yeah, his, yeah. His, his peak week has to be different. And I'm like, it's not, it's just so calculated that there's no mistakes. Right. So that's kind of how I meant it. So I'm you try to minimize your mistakes, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. No, but I'm the, glad that we were able to talk about it and, kind of you i was able to explain myself to you yeah absolutely and I, I i knew what you meant by it but i was going to bust your balls back because it, you know, <laughs> it was like i was like you're and like i said you just said that the winning the masters olympia is not that big of a deal <laughs> i didn't yeah. i did okay wait a minute just, just <laughs> clarify this <laughs> full on <laughs> masters yeah. olympia this is not be, a big deal the, that's the title this, this is the title <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did not, yeah. <laughs> let's me, simplify it me even more. winning me winning the masters olympia it would be no big deal let's just simplify it even more the olympia is not a big deal like we, remove <laughs> words from it. we remove words from it and just like paste up a portion that we yeah. want to put up i didn't say it's not a big deal i said i don't think it would change how i felt about my open group <laughs> does that make sense no, I'm still winning. Thinking, winning I'm the Olympia is not special. I'm digging a hole. I'm digging a hole. <laughs> the winning, that's the title. That's the one. Special. You know what? I give up. I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> we bro. We <laughs> fool. Never comes on the podcast ever again. No, <laughs> just, no I love you guys. It's yeah, all right. It's all right. That's awesome. Um, listen, I honestly, uh, honey, I love talking to you, Austin. It's nice to meet you. Great to meet uh, you. I had a great. I had a great time. Yeah. And uh, thank you for having me on, man. It's great. Absolutely, man. You know, yeah. um, again, we'll put Fuad's link to his show um, so that you guys can go out and see him and the live podcast. Um, uh, it, great, great lineup. You have Ian, you have Melissa, you have, um, you said who else is doing it? Guy, Guy and Mike Guy, Van Wick. Guy and Mike. So yeah. that's awesome. So again, thank you again, Fuad. It was, we've been talking about doing this podcast for a long time yeah. and I'm glad we were able to finally catch up. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me, man. Awesome. So again, that's the truth. Hani Rambod, Fuad, and we're out.